I'm General Rick Gillier. I'm the former Chief of Defense Staff. I'm a lifelong soldier. I'm a proud Canadian, uh, but I'm even more proud today to be sitting here with you, Jess. When was your first big contact with Taliban? It was on uh, October 14th. Was so, so let's walk to October the 14th. And are you got, were you still living at Spin Boldak up till close to that time? Uh, I think so. Yeah, if I we were we we're actually on the front line or on patrol base Wilson, okay, or the front line for the couple of weeks prior to that. So you were living out for part of that time, not yeah. at the actual bases, uh, not at the actual patrol bases themselves. Yeah. And when did you learn that you were going to deploy into Strong Point Center? And that area around there. What what what's the lead up to that? Um, we were we were just told uh, probably a couple hours before we left. We were in uh, Patrol Base Wilson. Yep. And we got the orders that we were going to be. Uh, protecting a bulldozer, building a road, and we would be deployed to Strong Point Center. And Strong Point Center was what when you arrived there? And was that the first time you arrived there on the 14th of October? Yeah. And what was what was Strong Point Center then? It was uh, a mix of a, a part... It's it was a mix of a ruins and a rock formation kind of combined together. Like it was just a kind of like a big rock. Okay. So so you were at Strong Point Wilson, and you're told you're deploying. Did Sergeant Tedford uh, bring the orders down that you were deploying? Yes. To the section. Yes. Did he get everybody together and say, okay, here's what we're going to do. Here's our mission. Yeah. Is that how he did things? Yeah. Okay. And so when did he do that? And like the night before or the morning of? Or? As soon as he got the information, he told us right away. Okay. And what did you do then following that? Just uh, if we weren't cleaning our guns, we were mounting up to go. Okay. Mounted up and you got into the Lav 3, yeah. the Light Armored Vehicle 3. Yeah. And were you down inside in that vehicle heading off to Strong Point Center or were you air sentry with your uh, head outside or? I can't remember to tell you the truth if I, okay. where I was uh, going in or out. I know on the way out I was inside, so on the way in I was probably outside because we take turns. Yep. Yeah. So you were down inside the vehicle going into Strong Point Wilson yeah. or going into Strong Point Center? Going into uh, going into Strong Point Center. Yeah. I was in the air sentry hatch. Okay. Because going out, uh, Private Malley was, he took the air sentry going out. And, and how many of you were in that lab? The, the entire section? Yeah. And, and Sergeant Tedford was in the section commander's spot in the cupola? He would... In the turret? In the turret. The Master Corporal LeBlanc was in the turret. He yep. was the the gunner, uh, the guy in charge of the gun. Yep. And uh, Sergeant Tedford was sitting in his spot. We all had a designated spot we always had to sit in. But Sergeant Tedford was in his spot on the radio. And and so you're moving down as, as a platoon? Yeah. So four vehicles again? Yeah. Moving down from Strong Point Wilson to Strong Point Center? Oh, actually, we before we went to Strong Point Center, we uh, did a patrol. Yeah. And uh, we all went out, all the sections went out, and uh, just did a patrol of the area. We had all four labs lined up against a grape grape wall. And uh, 
when we were leaving that patrol, we all mounted up to go to per Strong Point Center then. And as we were leaving, the one section ran over an IED. Yeah. Which section was that? I think that was one section. Okay. Yeah. And was there anybody hurt or killed in that IED? No. Fortunately, everybody made it. Okay. And the vehicle? The vehicle, I think, was destroyed. So what happened to that section then? They ended up going back to Patrol Base Wilson. So and you had proceeded on to Strong Point Center with three, with three labs, yes. not the four. So you're already, you were under strength, if you will, going into Strong Point Center. You weren't a full platoon. Yes, correct. And and do you recall your impressions when you arrived at Strong Point Center when the first time you saw it? I just, got, I thought it was a neat spot. <laughs> neat as in how? Just how it was. We were set up with the labs and how the outpost was set up and scenic you know it was and when you were deploying there or when you arrived there what did you know about Taliban activity or Taliban intentions or the enemy's intentions well um, we were we found we heard over the radio only uh, about five or ten minutes before the attack that we were going to be attacked. And then uh, everybody in the section was mounting up and getting into the lab for protection or to be deployed to counterattack. I was in the observation post. Or, no, I, I volunteered to go to the observation post. So I replaced a guy... And uh, that's where I stayed. But I, yeah, we had the intel that we were going to be hit. How did you get that intel? It just came down through the through the ranks. I'm not sure exactly. So it was passed on to you that you're going to be hit soon. Yeah, probably from uh, one of the locals or something. Who was asking, or or to whom did you volunteer, or who was asking for somebody to go into the observation post? Uh, Master Corporal LeBlanc was asking, he, he said, he, he actually said, guys, I'd rather not designate someone, so who's who wants to go? And I said, I'll go. And you went on up to the observation post. And what, what weaponry were you carrying in? Did you have what? I had I brought the C9 because there was already a C6 up there. Okay. But I brought my C6 ammo with me. So you had the light machine gun with ammunition. Yeah. And you had the heavier 7.62 machine gun with the ammunition that you carried, 600 rounds in your backpack and 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 200 was there 200 already on the on the weapon? I didn't have the weapon. I just had the C9. Yeah. And the backpack with the 600 rounds. Okay. For the C6. And so you okay. went up there. What time of day was this? Uh, it was about Two thirty, yeah. almost three o'clock. Okay, and what? And you had arrived at Strong Point Center, roughly what time? Late morning. Two, maybe two yeah. o'clock. So just just walk me through and tell me what happened from from then onwards during that day on the fourteenth of October. Well, um, I wasn't in the observation post very long, and. Uh, we we were fired upon, ambushed by the Taliban. Uh, they fired two rockets simultaneously. One hit the lab and one hit my observation post. Uh, the one that hit the lab killed Sergeant Darcy Tedford and Private Blake Williamson. And the one that hit me in the observation post just sent me flying. It was mostly dirt and debris. And the C6 machine gun kind of pushed into me and I flew back and hit my head on the back on the other side of the trench um, I came I was knocked out for about 
eight seconds, I think. It wasn't very long. It was just long enough for me to realize, well, I, crap, i just been knocked out. <laughs> but when I came to, I, uh, I crawled to, back to the C6 machine gun and started firing on the Taliban. And uh, I noticed that that uh, the turret wasn't work, working properly on our lav, on the section lav that had been hit. And they weren't firing. I knew something was wrong. Something was going on down there. I could see I had a bird's eye view of everything because I was at high, uh, highly elevated than everything else. So... Anyways, I uh, I fired the C6 a little bit at the Taliban, and then I was thinking, crap, I need something a little with a little more punch. And as they started to fire back at me, I could hear snaps in the air of the bullets breaking the sound barrier. That's what it actually sounds like when they're going past you close. But so I was just taking cover for from the fire and I looked over and noticed the big stack of uh, M72 rocket launchers. There was at least a dozen of them there. And uh, I returned fire with the rocket launchers, uh, taking out a lot of the Taliban. How far away were they, the Taliban fighters, do you think? The ones that I was worried about were, there was about 40 of them and Half of them were about 400 yards, and half of them were, 10 of them, let's say, were about 200 yards. And I fired at the ones that were 200 yards. I don't know if they were trying to take our position or what was going on because they were so close. But I figured I'd take those guys out because they were the closest. So I fired at them with M72 rocket launchers. And then uh, I started looking for uh, RPGs and a mortar pit because I noticed mortars were being walked into our position, like explosions in the dirt across the, or across the road. And they were coming close to uh, the section lab that had already been hit. So I fired M M72 rocket launcher at the mortar pit, then the Taliban mortar pit and uh, just started to really give them hell with the M72s. I fired all, almost all of them but two. I saved two for in case there was a, another attack afterwards. But then uh, uh, I continued to fire with the C6. So you went back to the C6? Yeah, because I wanted to save the last two rockets for just in case. And and so you're saving those last two rockets in case there's another mad assault coming towards you? Yeah. You're still under fire? Yes. Small arms fire, machine gun fire, rocket propelled grenade, RPG fire? I actually took a second R RPG, but it it just hit the wall below the sandbags that, and kind of blew dust and dirt in my face. It didn't affect me at all maybe the noise affected my hearing a bit but it uh it was a miss and how long a period roughly Jess did that assault continue about it was a good half an hour 40 minutes of us of me firing at them and them firing at me and you could see them during that time you yeah. at a distance or I had or up a, closer? I, I could see them. I had a bird's eye view of where I was, and I could see them clearly. And you were aiming directly at them either with the C6 or with the M72 rocket launchers? Yes, I wasn't just spraying the machine gun over my head or over the top of the sandbags. I was aiming properly and you making very effective fire on the enemy. So you were there by yourself in the observation post. Yeah. Where you had volunteered to go when Jeremy LeBlanc, the section second in command, asked for volunteers. Yeah. 
by yourself in the in the observation post. Yeah. You'd already been struck there by an RPG rocket propelled grenade round. Yeah. Which threw you back and knocked you out. Yeah. You brought fire to bear using the C6 machine gun. Did you take the rounds out of your backpack and use for the C6 or was there some already there for it? There was 200 in it when I got there. And uh, I, I was down to my last 100 rounds because I was counting. You will see, as this is going on, you got the battle's going on, you got to count everything. You, you count how many enemies you've killed, how many are alive, where they are, how much ammo you have left, how much water. You got, you got to be thinking about all that stuff all, all the time. It's uh, there's a lot more to it than just shooting back and forth at each other. But um, I was down to my last hundred rounds, and I stopped shooting because the battle was dying off, and uh, they were in retreat for sure. And uh, that's when uh, Captain Ray Corby came, made it out to the OP, and. I remember him yelling out to me, and I said, yeah, I'm here, I'm okay. And then he asked me, did you fire all these rocket launchers? Because they were everywhere. And I said, yes. And he said, cover me, I'm coming in. So I shot some rounds at just whatever I could till he got into the OP, and we had a chat, and I gave him as much intel about the enemy and what was going on as I could. And then uh, he asked me to cover for him, I could cover fire for him again, because he was going down to the two-section lab that had been hit. So I gave him cover fire for that. And it's still daylight? Yeah. Still daylight. What did you know about how the fight had gone for the rest of the platoon beyond seeing the two-section lab that had gotten hit? I knew uh, it was a three section and headquarters were still firing out of the turrets. I I think they were just giving cover fire. I don't know what they were firing at, yeah. but uh, I I knew, I knew that everyone was okay in the, those two labs because I could see, but. Uh, Captain Corby or somebody, there was one other guy, a warrant officer came out, and one of them said, we have two VSA, uh, vital signs absent. So uh, I knew it was a two-section lab because I didn't see either of the other labs take any fire at all. So you knew there were casualties? Yeah. And, and specifically, you knew there were other soldiers Yes. In the platoon, probably in your section, yeah. that had been killed. Yeah. You did not know who at this stage. No. Okay. So what happened after the fight? You're you're still into the fight. The other labs are providing fire. Yeah. You think it's covering fire. You don't see where they're, where they're targeting. Yeah. You're still in the observation post yourself. You saved a hundred rounds on the C6, and you've got a couple of M72 rocket launchers left. You're holding in in reserve, <laughs> so to speak, here. So what happened after that? The, the, the firefight has died a bit, according to what you said, I think. Yes. <clears throat> well, uh, after that, what was going on was a lot of people were, I think, trying to take care of the wounded because there was, I think, almost everybody but two guys in the section took shrapnel Everybody had some sort of wound. So that's what uh, the platoon commander was trying to take care of. And he got word to Corporal Chris, no, not Chris, Ted Sawmier, not Ted Sawmier, Ted Running Lloyd, sorry, uh, to get me ammo. And he brought me a fresh box of ammo and water because I had sucked my camel back dry during that fire firefight. There was no more water or ammo. And what did you anticipate, Jess? Did you know that you were going to be up there for quite a longer period and after you got that resupply or you were going to be replaced or reinforced? 
Well, the the platoon warrant officer came out and asked me uh, if I wanted to be replaced, and I said, no, I, I'll stay. I don't think you want to put somebody through that who hasn't been through it before. I can handle it if it happens again. And he said, okay, well, I'll send you a partner at least. And I said, that'd be great. So uh, Corporal uh, Daryl Jones came out, and he was he was there to help me out. And so now you're with Daryl Jones in the observation post. Time carries on. The attack has died a bit. When did you first learn who we had lost in that uh, lab? When Daryl came out because uh, he was uh, from two section. And he, he was told in, and he told me. That Darcy Tedford and, and Blake, Blake Williamson Wilson. had both been killed. Yeah. And that some of the others had been wounded. Mm -hmm. And so what happened after, after this? Well, uh, everything died off. It got real quiet. And uh, they brought, they took two section to patrol base Wilson. And we actually ended up s spending the night in the observation post. Me, Daryl Jones, and Warren Officer Scott Robertson slept in the observation post that night. Did you get a resupply of water to keep you going? Yeah. What about food? Did you eat during that time frame? No. No, we didn't eat. Were there any further attacks from the Taliban then throughout the night? No. So the attack was over and done with and 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 the platoon had beaten it off. Yeah. And you were right at the point of the spear. Yeah. Were you in any pain yourself then? Ah, uh, yes, I was in a lot of pain. My neck and back were really hurting, and uh, I was bleeding from my ear, from my uh, right ear. Did you have ear defenders or plugs in of any kind when you were no. firing those rocket launchers or getting fired up on? No, because you, you can't wear... When you're in an observation post and you're supposed to be observing, you can't wear hearing protection, so... Observing with all your senses? Yeah. Including yeah. hearing. Yeah. And your neck and back were hurting from when you were thrown back and against the back part of the trench by the rocket that exploded. Yeah. Yeah. And and did you any other injuries or, or wounds or anything obvious or visible? Um I was having problems with my uh vision in my right eye. My retina was detached. Later I found out. So bleeding yeah. from the ears, yeah. retina detached in your right eye, yeah. what you found out after the fact, yeah. and you're in significant pain from the neck and back. Yeah, and I was, ha I w I was having trouble walking. Like uh, I'd stand up to go, I went stand up to go pee, and I ended up pissing all over mm -hmm. myself because I couldn't, st I fell. I would, just my equilibrium was shot, and... I, I was walking like a drunk, even though I had nothing to drink, you know. So you and Jones and Robertson were in the OP then for the rest of the evening? Yeah. Throughout the night? Yeah. Uh, all was quiet? Yeah. What did you keep, one person on, two people on, one sleeping? We tried to keep one on and two guys resting. Nobody slept, though, I don't think. No. So you didn't get any sleep that night? No. So what happened then the next morning at the first light and from then onwards on, on the 15th of October? Uh, our platoon was replaced by another platoon. And uh, we headed back to uh, Kandahar Airfield. Directly from Strong Point Center back to Kandahar? I think I can't remember if we... Oh, no, we stopped at uh, Patrol Base Wilson. And from there, we went to Kandahar. And when we got... Back to Kandahar, it was night, the next day, nighttime. And uh, that we did the ramp ceremony right away for uh, Darcy and Blake. Who carried the coffins for Darcy and Blake? I can't remember. Members of the platoon? Yeah. yeah. I helped carry uh, Blake. 
Blake was a good friend of yours, was he? Yeah. Do you know where where was he from? Uh, what was the name of Canada? Yeah, and you had known him since you'd started this train up. Yeah. Was, had he been one of the individuals who went through training, or no? Okay, so I, you met him at when you arrived in the section. Yes. And that's when you also met Darcy Tedford. Yes. Okay, so you helped carry the coffin of Blake onto the onto the C-130. Yes. On that ramp ceremony. Yeah. You remember vividly that time frame? That was hurting, but I do remember it. Yeah. Incredibly emotional, isn't it, saying goodbye to a friend? Yeah, it is. Yeah. And so you finish that ramp ceremony. You're hurting, as you said. Yeah. What happened then following that? So now we're in night of 15 October. Yeah. I and you've been going pretty much flat out for 48 hours. Yeah. I went to, uh, I can't remember which hospital, but one of the hospitals in Kandahar. And uh, the doctor said I had uh, fractured vertebrae in my neck and back. I had broken vertebrae in my back and fractured vertebrae in my neck and uh, they'd be sending me home. So that was at the Roll 3 hospital in Kandahar? I think so. Yeah and and that you were now you're told you're going to be sent home? Yeah. And so are, are we into the next day now with by the time that medical assessment is taking place and yeah I assume x-rays and those kinds of things? Yeah. Okay and when did your mom and dad know that you were hurting? Uh, actually, when I got a chance, I called them, and I told them, and uh, they said, oh, geez, on the news, they said it was uh, RCDs that had been hit, and so we weren't really worried about you, but I said, no, it was us, and Darcy and Blake are dead, and filled them in, and they said, geez, and I said, yeah, I'm on my way home because I'm injured. You know, of course, off our initiative, Valor in the Presence of the Enemy. Mm -hmm. And part of that initiative is a petition to the House of Commons and a request to our Commander-in-Chief, the Governor-General, right. to review your citation for the Star of Military Valor uh, based on the actions of 14 October of your Valor in the Presence of the Enemy, to review that citation, to consider several other aspects including the fact that you volunteered to go into that observation post and to upgrade your star of military valor to a Victoria Cross. What, right. what are your thoughts when you hear that? I'm a uh, little bit shocked. Like, in shock, I don't know what to say about that. I could, you know, I could have gotten in a lot of trouble for doing what I did that day on the 14th of October because uh, standard operation procedure dictates that the soldier is to abandon the observation post in the situation I was in. You're not supposed to stay and fight. You, you can be charged. So, for something I could have gotten in trouble over and now all this, it's a pretty overwhelming. Yeah. Well, Jess, I, I just want to say thank you. And I want to say every one of us that had anything to do with Afghanistan and your rotation and the 1st Battalion of the Royal Canadian Regiment Battle Group, we're all glad that you stayed in that observation post that day. Because if you had not, the consequences would have been even more severe and more tragic without doubt. Mm -hmm. And so we thank you for being the great, great, incredible individual that you are. Thank you the great soldier that you were. Thank you. And we thank you for everything you've done, not just, not just on the 14th of October. And it's a real pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you, sir. So for the ladies and gentlemen, for anybody listening, in front of me is a great Canadian and a great soldier and an incredible young man who I'm proud to know. And I'm proud to have served beside him as a soldier in the Canadian forces at the same time. Thanks, Jess. Pleasure to see you. A pleasure to see you too, sir.